take it away. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're very excited to have Elvin here with us, who's calling in all the way from Indonesia. Elvin is a country director at Xiaomi and has been at the company for over seven years. Um, so for tonight, uh, he'll first start off with a short presentation on Xiaomi's business, which would then be followed by a conversation in Q&A that will be moderated by Avicho. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Elvin. Great. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina, Ashley, and uh, Avichal for inviting me to this uh, awesome community, uh, SPC. So I was actually uh, browsing the website and trying to learn a little bit more about the community. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, pleasantly surprised to find very uh, quite a few familiar names uh, in the community. Um, you know, today I see uh, folks like uh, Jonathan, a uh, long time. I haven't met, uh, I haven't seen you for a while. Hope everything is well. Um, I got an email from Wasim. Uh, who actually came uh, visit me in Beijing, uh, you know, right before he started, uh, before he started pilot. And, uh, and, and you know, Gloria, my uh, former boss at Flipboard. Uh, so, you know, what, a, what an amazing community. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm also very uh, honored to be invited because I saw such a star studded lineup. So, uh, you know, very tough to match the, match the same standards, but uh, at the same time, I hope I could offer some Asia perspectives uh, because uh, I've been uh, privileged enough to see how kind of the US-China cross-border innovation uh, corridor uh, in the early days, uh, as well as now, you know, more and more so in India and Indonesia. So hopefully today we can chat a little bit about uh, these Asia opportunities as well as how we can get more, you know, Bay Area, Silicon Valley trained uh, folks to be involved in these corridors, uh, because I believe there are a lot of uh, innovation opportunities as well as, you know, investment opportunities as well. Um, so I'm going to quickly start off uh, maybe a 15 minutes uh, quick presentation because uh, Xiaomi, uh, which is the company I'm working for right now, uh, we currently do not operate in United States. So a lot of uh, folks uh, in the U.S. still, uh, you know, don't really know what we're about. So, you know, really quickly, just give a little bit of context and then we can uh, dive into a you know, more discussion based uh, format. So I'm going to quickly share my screen right now and uh, hopefully all works uh, fine. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see it clearly. I'm gonna go into full screen. Perfect. All right, so um, Xiaomi is a listed company. Um, you know, we are, we're listed on Hong Kong Stock Exchange about uh, almost three years now. Uh, and uh, I wanna give, quickly give you a little bit of my, how I got into Xiaomi and, you know, this whole Asia opportunity. So it all started here. Uh, I was, uh, you know, chit-chatting with uh, Avichao and, you know, obviously Christina as well, this common connection uh, and I got, caught by the entrepreneurial bug early on uh, at school. Um, and actually, if I look back uh, at how I kind of got into China, it was because not only was I heavily involved in BASIS, which was sort of the entrepreneurial community on campus, I started a Chinese version of it, uh, which is called CEO, uh, Chinese Entrepreneur Organization when I was there. And uh, to date, uh, it, it's still uh, running and uh, it, it's uh, one of the more popular organizations for the GSB students uh, to learn about China. And uh, in that organization, we saw a lot of IPO uh, companies as well. So I guess, you know, communities, you know, really have, uh, you know, some magic power. Uh, I was also a student entrepreneur. Uh, one day, hopefully after Xiaomi, I get to uh, go back to my roots. Uh, so when I was a sophomore in college, uh, I uh, started my own iPhone app company. And this was pre-Instagram, uh, pre kind of Snapchat days, uh, way before that. And uh, we were actually amongst the first to build uh, photography filters. And we built it to the uh, number one spot in the app store in the photographies category. Uh, and then, you know, obviously Instagram and Path and all these companies started and started building social communities out of photos. Uh, but we were pretty early on. And, you know, I'm originally from Hong Kong. So you can see, you know, in Hong Kong, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship is not common at all. Hong Kong is very much a place about, you know, capital markets, real estate, uh, you know, financiers, you know, so startups back then were kind of rare. So, you know, we got these kind of a newspaper coverage. And then soon after, uh, after Silicon Valley, I, I love the Bay, but, you know, I spent a good six years there. And then uh, I got this calling uh, to start thinking about the China market through this opportunity at Flipboard. And um, I uh, took the jump. I was uh, quite young back then and, uh, you know, without families and all that. So, uh, just moved out to Beijing. Uh, it was my first kind of, um, you know, living in mainland China, which is, you know, extremely different from Hong Kong. Uh, and through this journey, I just kind of followed this rocket ship of Xiaomi uh, when I first joined 
uh, they were only doing smartphones. And then since then, you know, a variety of products. And uh, because of this journey, they brought me to markets uh, like India, which, uh, you know, that, that photo uh, with uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, I was the one actually holding the Xiaomi phone, taking the photo for our CEO and co-founder. And, uh, you know, also the roadshow in uh, New York, I had the opportunity to participate in an IPO roadshow. Uh, and then, you know, in Europe, we opened uh, our flagship store at the uh, Champs de Lisée in Paris. So this journey was a, a lot of kind of coincidences. I, I certainly did not plan my career in India, uh, but I found it to be such a fascinating uh, market. And uh, you know, that's why I'm uh, loving to share this story with all of you. So Xiaomi is a 10 year old company, uh, started actually 2010 when mobile internet started picking off. And uh, you know, back then, if we think about it, our competitors were not the standard startup incumbents. You know, we were competing with Apple and Samsung. Uh, arguably some of the you know, biggest giants that you could face. So how could a 15 people kind of startup with about only 10 million US funding uh, uh, fight with these huge giants? So you know, the first thing you realize is our logo. Um, I'm also wearing my, you know, my shirt here, uh, oh, right here, MI. So a lot of people thought you know, MI really stood for Mission Impossible. Um, when in fact, uh, our, our CEO and co-founder actually wanted it to mean uh, mobile internet. Um, he was one of the first in China to go all in on mobile internet. Um, in 2008, he retired and uh, he IPO'd a, a company back then called Kingsoft, which was sort of like the Microsoft office of China. And uh, he visited the Valley. He came to Stanford and uh, he met a lot of uh, uh, iPhone um, uh, developers. And he felt like, wow, you know, this is going to be the next big thing. So he went back to China and he bet, you know, most of his net worth on mobile internet startups and, you know, obviously profited hugely. Um, you know, companies like YY, uh, you know, which is sort of like a, a, a gaming live streaming uh, public company now, you know, worth around uh, 10, 11 billion dollars. He was the major investor there. Um, so he IPO'd since, uh, you know, some four companies, uh, thanks to this mobile internet wave. And in 2010, he felt like, okay, he needed to start a platform. He needed to be a, you know, major player uh, in the mobile internet world. And he believes he could change it. So that's why he started Xiaomi. And here, here's the result. Uh, when when you start something in the in the kind of with the momentum and the timing uh, and the resources that he has, you can see some of these milestones. And and and, and you know we were uh, the the fastest growing startup back in the days. And you can see some of these revenue milestones. Uh, thankfully, we're a hardware company, so it's easier to reach these revenue numbers. Uh, but in 2019, we became the youngest company to join Fortune Global 500. And uh, you know the the the, the growth rate uh, continues to be quite impressive uh, thanks to this interesting. Uh, model that I will share in a bit. Uh, continue to rise in the ranks. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, uh, people would think that smartphone is a commodity. You know, there's not much innovation. Uh, and, and you know, if we look at the growth rate, actually, there's still a lot of room for for growth, uh, especially in developing markets that you know, like Indonesia that I'm in. Uh, in terms of brand, uh, uh, thankfully, you know, we are one of the few brands uh, that have a very loyal fan base. Uh, if you think about other companies in the consumer electronics space, maybe you could think of Sony, Nintendo, maybe a a of course Apple, you know, only a few brands that have truly kind of loyal fan base and, you know, we're quite pleased to be one of those. Until today, um, I actually first joined the global team very early on uh, to help a Chinese company go global, uh, which was quite rare actually uh, 10 years ago. And now today we are already in about 90 plus markets of which about 50 of them were uh, ranked amongst the top five. Um, so you can see some of the, the, the key markets, uh, India being the key one. Um, so I participated in that whole growth journey uh, about five years ago. And uh, we got to the number one spot, uh, dislodging uh, Samsung after, after many, many years of Samsung becoming number one. You know, we finally became number one, you know, two and a half, three years ago. And uh, becoming more and more popular in Europe as well. Um, the only place uh, I guess we're not really operating would be the uh, would be U.S. as well as uh, you know the U.S. sanctioned uh, countries. So those are the you know few markets that we kind of uh, try to not touch. Uh, but otherwise, you know, in Africa, it's growing fast. Latin America, uh, so on and so forth. Today we're the number three largest smartphone brand. Um, so right behind uh, Samsung and Huawei, uh, as you may know, you know Huawei obviously uh, under some uh, restrictions. So, you know, their market share continues to drop and it's up for us, uh, Samsung, uh, to grab. Uh, and, you know, so ho hopefully the goal from the company's perspective is to become the number one smartphone brand company by shipment uh, in, within three years, within three years, that's the target. Uh, here's some of the lineup. 
Uh, we have uh, obviously more lineups than uh, uh, Apple, but at the same time, much less uh, than Samsung and the other Android companies. We are actually quite focused. Uh, we prefer a model that is a much more focused portfolio, allowing us to have this uh, scaling advantages. So here are some of the lineups, uh, you know, all the way from about 150 US dollars all the way up to uh, you know eight, uh, you know seven eight hundred US dollars. So that's the uh, our, our key kind of product lineup. This is where things get a little bit interesting. Um, we actually heavily engaged with our users through software. So uh, you can see today we have almost uh, three hundred fifty million uh, monthly active on this platform, and uh, you know because of this massive user base, uh, we can actually do a lot of interesting innovations on the platform itself. Uh, not just advertising, obviously, as a main internet service revenue stream, but also a lot of uh, you know, gaming publishers. Uh, you could imagine you know, maybe one day some of you wanted to start uh, a company in some of these markets that we operate in, and you know, there may be some uh, interesting innovations you could play off uh, this mobile platform of ours and um, um, uh, reach some of these users of ours. This is where we believe the next 10 years lies, uh, which is the smartphones times AIoT trend. Um, in the past 10 years, I think the smart home, smart living concept was mentioned many, many times, but uh, truly thanks to 5G, I think this is finally becoming a reality where a lot of your smart products at home are seamlessly connected to one another. Um, and you know, we, we have this big strategy over the next 10 years that smartphones must be uh, interacting uh, seamlessly with these smart home products, right? The handoff, has to be seamless, the data transfer, uh, some of the applications that could be shared across these different platforms. Um, so that's that's why it's a multi multiplication, not an addition. Um, we, you know, our CEO promised to invest a lot of money uh, in this space, uh, thanks to 5G again, to populate a lot of these. Uh, in China, we're actually working with uh, real estate developers uh, to truly kind of populate some of these smart products into these real uh, residential buildings. This is another very interesting thing. I think a lot of people uh, isn't aware. Uh, we are actually the world's largest hardware incubator. Um, so we actually invest and incubate more than 300 companies uh, of which uh, around 10 of those already IPO'd uh, either on you know, mainland China stock exchange or you know, in, in, in the States. Uh, some of the more popular ones these days like Huami, uh, which does our uh, Mi Band, which is our smart wearable product. Um, so they are, they are listed on NASDAQ and, you know, recently the stock has a run, run up. So then now they're worth more than a billion dollars. So our model is about identifying the best entrepreneurs uh, who are extremely focused uh, on their respective fields. Uh, we invest some money, take maybe about 20% share. And then um, once the product meets our quality standard, uh, we actually give them our brand uh, and we give them our distribution channel. Um, so as an entrepreneur, it's, it's amazing. You know, you, all you need to focus on is the product, the R&D. Once one is done, we give you our manufacturing resources, we give you the supply chain, we give you the marketing, um, and your success rate is much, much higher. Um, so this model is working beautifully for us. And that is how we got to all these products. Um, in fact, uh, some of you, uh, before COVID, um, there was a, a very, very popular startup called Bird, yeah, uh, with, the, with all the scooters and the likes. And uh, uh, actually, 80% of those scooters were manufactured by Xiaomi. Um, so at one point, the Bird executives and all those... Uh, Mobility startup uh, executives are all flying to our headquarters to try to get the supply uh, because it was so hot. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of these amazing products, including, you know, the robot vacuum cleaner. Uh, we have a rice cooker that is smart and, you know, we could actually determine uh, which, which, which rice, uh, which province is from, right? And then recommend you the best recipe for cooking the rice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why there's a smart rice cooker concept as well. Uh, by shipment, again, Xiaomi is uh, the number one uh, wearable ba uh, band brand. Uh, before Xiaomi came along, uh, if you think about Fitbit, uh, Jawbone, and all these uh, other companies, they were selling, you know, these smart wearables at around 150 bucks, um, you know, at Best Buy or whatnot. And when we came in, we, we kind of, you know, really thought about this product, you know, what is the key feature of it? What can we do? What can we reduce? What can we pull away uh, in order to give more people the access uh, to these amazing products. And we launched our first Mi Band one at uh, only at around 10 bucks, 10 bucks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it could record your, your exercises steps. It has, uh, you know, almost uh, 20 days of battery life. Uh, and, you know, within a year, within a year, um, you know, the shipment skyrocketed. And, uh, you know, since then we've, uh, you know, become the number one wearable band brand in the world. 
smart speakers, uh, you know, obviously in Chinese, uh, you know, similar to, to Amazon Alexa and, and the likes, uh, you know, we have almost uh, closer to 100 million now uh, by end of 2020. So a lot of people are using um, uh, smart speakers and uh, smart assistants in China today. TV, we also have smart TVs as well. We're top five, uh, you know, uh, up there, right up there with, you know, Sony, Samsung, LG. So this is how it works. Uh, this is sort of the smart home setup uh, in, a, in, a, in one of our users' home. Uh, and you can see that we have one app on our phone called the Mi Home app that connects everything. So here's the UI. Um, so you can really easily see, you know, temperature, humidity, uh, pollution. Uh, you know, China suffers from pollution, of course. Um, you can actually use a security camera, see different rooms. You can turn it on and off. You can have automated uh, sequences in the app as well. So when you go home, it automatically turns on, turns off. Uh, so on and so forth. So this is truly the future that we see. So uh, all these are connected devices, uh, not counting our smartphones. Uh, so there are many, many people actually hooking up these smart IoT products to the internet, uh, to our smartphones. And, uh, you know, uh, we see a lot of interesting use cases for them, uh, which is why, you know, actually we are already one of the largest consumer IoT platform. And I think Google's Nest and all those companies were trying to push quite hard, uh, you know, a few years back. Uh, but, you know, in China, actually, this is already getting a, quite a, quite a main, mainstream uh, practices. So really quickly, just to show uh, some of the futuristic uh, applications that uh, could come out of this space uh, to give some, give every one of us uh, some room for imagination. Uh, so quick, quickly play a very short video. So you get the idea. Um, a lot of these use cases are already uh, a reality uh, in China. So if there's a hardware entrepreneur in the audience, uh, we definitely welcome a lot of cooperation and uh, partnership. So uh, we're almost running out of time in terms of the presentation. So wanted to quickly share a little bit about, you know, what makes Xiaomi so unique and so successful. This is the first uh, chart uh, that our CEO uh, presented when he first started the company 10 years ago. Uh, it is now becoming more and more common for a lot of hardware startups, you know, including uh, Peloton, right, which is uh, doing very, very well. Um, it is this triathlon business model. Uh, initially, uh, we produce only hardware, but then these hardware are sold at cost, uh, pretty much at cost. You know, our, our gross margin is very, very thin. 
And we see this as a vehicle to deliver uh, internet services to our audience. Now, in order to truly bring it to a very, very low cost, you need to have your own distribution channel, which is why back then, 10 years ago, uh, we heavily rely on our own uh, e-commerce stores uh, and as well as some of the other e-commerce platforms in China. Uh, and then later on, we started our own retail stores, uh, which is also powered by, of course, data. And uh, uh, after all these things are integrated, then you can truly enjoy the reduced cost uh, and then offering the products at even lower cost uh, and, and you know, raising the barrier of uh, competition. So this is the first model uh, that, that we kind of uh, uh, advocated. And uh, since then, a lot of hardware companies have adopted a similar mindset in order to uh, scale up uh, their businesses. Um, so when we actually uh, you know, went on our IPO in the States, a lot of the investors uh, aren't really sure how to categorize Xiaomi, right? Xiaomi is not just a hard a smartphone company, also a new retail company as well as an internet company. So right now we're still very much uh, focusing on smartphones and you know getting as many amazing products to, to our consumers' hands. But in the future, as the company moves into the next 10 years, it's truly about you know how, what kind of internet services can we provide to these users uh, that already enjoy our hardware. These are a few things to just keep in mind uh, you know, when you do a hardware uh, uh, startup. Uh, innovation wise, you know, again, a lot of people thought smartphones, how, how, how else could it be innovated? So actually we're extremely excited about the future. Uh, if you look at some of the supply chain uh, advances in China, you can see screens that are foldable, that are flexible, right? And uh, you know, we are one of the first to kind of do it without the notch. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can really see a lot of these really cool tech coming out of smartphones. And you know, we think uh, sooner or later, uh, a lot of these tech will, will go, to, you know, go to the States through iPhone as well. This is a concept phone. You can see smartphones could be like this, right? You know, both the front display and the back display, 180 degree surround display uh, with, the, with the sides also uh, panel as well. So a lot of these cool things happening. Um, this is another really special thing about Xiaomi. Uh, right before IPO, the CEO and co-founder actually promised, uh, wrote it into the constitution of the company that Xiaomi's hardware business cannot exceed, cannot exceed 5%. So this is a promise and a commitment to the consumers that you know, whenever you walk into a Xiaomi store, you can be sure that you're basically paying what you, you, know, what you get. Every dime is worth it. Uh, we're not going to make uh, you know crazy margins on the hardware. Uh, we like to think of this as a kind of a restaurant tipping business, right? You enjoy the food, which is the main course, and uh, if our service is good, you know you tip us, right? So that's the that's the idea. You know, can you actually tip us enough on the internet services so that we can still be a you know a, a really great company for the long long time? And because of this commitment. You can see we have a lot of fans. Uh, so you know we talk about community for SPC you know, from the Stanford days. And uh, it is extremely important for any kind of D2C brand and, you know, hardware companies to have a fan base because they truly give you very valuable feedback. Um, we have apps that uh, we, we actually interact with them. We have a lot of uh, official community sites where we have uh, so-called the me presidents uh, that host these offline gatherings, I guess, playing the role like Ashley and, um, you know, keeping them very engaged. Uh, these me fans, also give us a lot of product feedback. Uh, you know, we back in the early days, uh, our engineers before they start coding, they must visit uh, the MeFans forum to learn about all these feature requests. And you know, we actually put out you know which feature we should build next, and then uh, people will vote. A couple more uh, uh, kind of insights into kind of Xiaomi's uh, kind of consumer brand uh, uh, rising, right? Uh, one of the key things that we leverage on is truly word of mouth and. This is a graph that uh, you know, our CEO kind of summarized for the group. And um, on the left-hand side, you see things that matter a lot in the internet era, right? You need to be extremely focused because as a startup, you don't have that much resources. Things that you do have to be as perfect as it should be because on social media, if you have a bad review, you're, you're kind of screwed, right? Um, you know, the, the messaging, the communication travels very, very extremely fast. Um, and therefore, you know, when we think about word of mouth, um, we really need this to kind of get our marketing costs to be low, right? Because as a startup, you don't have ten, tens of millions of dollars to spend on TV. So at the end of the day, he said, you know, word of mouth is truly about exceeding users' expectation, right? It's not about the product being expensive. It's not about the product being cheap. It's about exceeding users' expectations. So one of the key things when we think about marketing is, um, you know, how do we manage users' expectation and then exceed it and beat it, 
right? We want to we want you to think of that. Well, this product, this Mi Band, is it should be worth fifty U.S. dollar, but through our operating efficiency, we offer it to you at ten U.S. dollar, and then you'll be like, wow, you know, let me let me tell my friends about it. Uh, we like to think about leverage as well. Uh, as a startup, uh, uh, back back then, you know, we really don't have that budget, so you really need to ride a lot of the momentum that is happening on social media. And you know, Xiaomi is extremely good at that. You know, we want to invite the Mi fans to kind of play with us on social media. We have killer products. Uh, we don't have like a portfolio. We really focus on on one. Uh, you know, the, the yesterday I was just you know uh, checking out Twitter and this startup company called Italic. You know, you know they have been doing different bags and luxury items. But then the the item that really got them the word of mouth is the candle, a very affordable, high quality candle, right? And and this is the power of killer products. You know, really zooming into one or two things that your consumer really you know wants. Last but not least, uh, before we open up the q and I want to talk a little bit about uh, angel investing. So Xiaomi's career brought me to all these interesting markets. And one thing that I realized is that the Silicon Valley trained uh, mindset uh, can really help a lot of these emerging uh, uh, tech circles. So when I arrived in India, uh, you know, I, I started you know, applying some of these mental models uh, you know, to entrepreneurs that I met. And uh, what you realize is that they're extremely talented, uh, extremely hardworking, uh, really good engineers. Right. But sometimes they, 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 they want that world's perspective. They want that, you know, how does Silicon Valley think about these things? Right. And, and because of this, I, I had the opportunity to become friends with some of them uh, quite early on 2017, when I believe uh, Y Combinator just started receiving uh, the first batch of India startups. Uh, and since then, you know, until today, I believe uh, India startup scene uh, is probably one of the most bullish markets uh, for the next five to 10 years uh, for many, many good reasons. And uh, I remain heavily uh, invested there. And you know, obviously, uh, we have more edge there as well uh, as compared to uh, in the Valley where you have you know, amazing investors like Avichal already, right? Whereas you know, in other markets like Indonesia, in India, uh, you know, there are so many, many opportunities for Silicon Valley trained uh, entrepreneurs to help and contribute. So just some of the, you know, some of the portfolio uh, companies, just listing some of them, um, you know, my full portfolio is on AngelList and uh, you know, more than happy to collaborate with any of you who are excited about emerging markets. Uh, the Marquet investment is Misho. Uh, it is actually very Indian focused uh, 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 company uh, that enables reselling, enables reselling. So a lot of housewives in India, they don't have any income. And uh, Misho started about four years ago that gave them a catalog and all they need to do uh, back in back in, when they first started was to share the catalog to their communities uh, uh, through WhatsApp, through WhatsApp. So it's truly, you know, a, a unicorn company built on top of the WhatsApp ecosystem. Um, and since then, you know, I've, you know, I've done a lot of interesting companies in India and, you know, I, I believe it's still very early um, and there are still a lot of opportunities and you're seeing a little bit more conversation in Silicon Valley about India. Uh, with, um, you know, folks like Balaji's and, and the likes. And I think uh, the wave has just started. So for some of you, you know, who are extremely excited about India, you know, we see some similarities in Indonesia as well. Uh, you know, we'd love to chat. So I think that's roughly what I want to share today. And um, thank you so much for having me again. I hope this was helpful for everyone and gives you a little bit more understanding about Xiaomi and, you know, its model. So I'll leave it to uh, Avichal for uh, questions. Thank you. Oh. Cool. That was great, Alvin. Thank you for doing that. Um, do you want to uh, stop, sharing, stop uh, sharing your screen, and then we can um, we'll we'll see it nice and big when we're, when we're talking, and we can see if there are more um, people have questions. So as a as a sort of part of Q and A, if anybody has questions, just uh, type them over on the on the chat on the side, and I'll try to work them in. Uh, we had some people who sent in questions earlier, so um, maybe we'll start with those. So um, and I'm going to take some creative liberties with some of the questions too. So I think my, my first question is you, you kind of were touching on this a little bit with um, like the 5% cap on hardware and, and some of the other things you touched on. Um, you know, in my experience, at least a lot of the really best companies in the world that managed to be as successful um, as you all have been uh, mm. have a very like at their core actually usually have like one to three beliefs that are that are fundamentally different like they believe a very small number of things that most other people don't believe and so i'm mm. curious like what what do you guys believe that most other companies don't believe namely you know maybe samsung or apple like what's fundamentally different about your worldview uh, relative to some of your competitors yeah great question i think for us uh you know our ceo truly believes that uh in order to become a hundred year old company it's not about it's not about the profit that you make it's about how many users you can win 
right? So we've kind of turned the traditional hardware company's model upside down by not focusing on the units sold per se, but how many users you can acquire. Right? He truly believes that great companies win the hearts of the users. That is why, you know, we kind of look at hardware users as a lifetime value uh, type of model. Um, when you think about why we built ecosystem products, right? The 2000 plus myriad of products that, that you saw on the slides. Uh, partly obviously is to kind of have this ecosystem and create an extra motive for the business, but partly it's also because when you think about our users as a um, uh, true human being, instead of a transaction, uh, you want to engage with them as much as you can, right? It's all about frequency, right? And, and if you think about a, a standard smartphone store, uh, most of the time you walk in only when you want to buy a smartphone, which is you know, once in two years. Right, so partly uh, the, the beauty of having this ecosystem is we can actually launch products monthly and then encouraging you to come back to our stores, almost like a, you know, a toy store uh, for adults, right, for the tech enthusiasts. And that way, you know, we have this ongoing relationship. And to further strengthen that and to kind of retain our users, we have this promise of not making more than 5%. So every time you walk in, you can truly trust that whatever you get would be the best value. Right. You don't need, even need to look at the, you know, the, the price tag. Um, so that, were, that, is, that is kind of the, the worldview that we subscribe to. How important is that retail store for you guys? Like, is that a pretty significant source of, of revenue and product sales uh, through the retail yes. stores? Or like, how, does, how does that work with online sales these days, especially in sort of yeah. era of COVID? So actually, 10 years ago, uh, uh, e-commerce in China was picking up rapidly thanks to Alibaba and JD. Um, and you know, in China, logistics uh, infrastructure is amazing. So uh, uh, our CEO back then subscribed to the view that, you know, e-commerce will dominate retail, right? Which unfortunately turned out to be not true, which is why, you know, actually in our last 10 years, we had three years of dip in, in business. And that was primarily because he overestimated uh, the e-commerce adoption and then underestimated the power of retail. Um, so what happened then was, you know, we had to immediately kind of scale, uh, you know, our stores and partner shops uh, to truly reach the second tier, third tier, and fourth tier cities uh, in China. Uh, if you look at why, you know, Pinduoduo, uh, PDD, you know, one of the favorite stocks of uh, U.S. investors now, uh, it's because uh, they truly uh, uh, took care of the underserved, um, you know, kind of second, third, fourth tier cities uh, users in China, which, which is massive. Uh, and uh, right now, you know, for Xiaomi, we are playing catch up on that front. So what happens is uh, the, the goal is that in every uh, small city of China, we need to have at least one, one store in order to truly reach these people. Uh, you would be amazed, but uh, you know, e-commerce adoption is still 20% in China. Oh, interesting. Yeah. How does, how does that work outside China? Like, do you use a similar strategy outside of China in terms of like uh, retail stores and also in terms of like tier one cities versus tier two, tier three, tier four? Like, how does that work outside yeah. China for you all? Yeah, so we took a more efficient retail expansion model compared to Samsung uh, and, and the likes. So Samsung and the likes, what they do is that uh, they try, try to partner as many as they can. What we like to do is, you know, we actually visualize the map and we look at, you know, where are the clusters that matter for us? And all you need is actually one store per cluster that drives all the traffic to that particular store so that they make enough turnover and fully support your business, right? Uh, you don't really need 10 Xiaomi stores on one street. Right? You only need one per street so that everyone goes there. So that is a more efficient way of doing retail through data. Um, and uh, we are applying the same in India. Uh, you know, we're now doing the same in Indonesia. Uh, that way, uh, actually, you would be surprised. Uh, the, the retail cost is still much affordable. Uh, our operating costs end to end uh, from manufacturing all the way to customer support is uh, 8%. 8%, which means, uh, you know, even if my gross you know, gross profit of hardware is at, you know, 11%, I still make a healthy, you know, three, 4%. Um, so it's all about kind of squeezing that operating cost uh, as much as we can uh, while we expand re uh, in retail. That's fascinating. Um, one thing you said is really interesting um, was this idea of um, like, you think about the customer holistically, like there's a bunch of touch points over the course of the day and it's not just about the smartphone, it's about all these other applications. It, it actually reminds me of um, uh, WeChat has a very similar sort of philosophy. It's like how many times over the course of 24 hours can you can you touch the user? Um, yes. And so when, when you guys are thinking about like your, your first party products and your third party products, is that, mm -hmm. is that, how does that factor into your prioritization at all? Like, do you actually try to think of it that way or do you just sort of say, you know, run a thousand experiments and let a thousand flowers bloom and kind of whatever comes out that's the best product is okay. So it sort of touches on kind of the incubator stuff you're talking about as well. I'm, I'm curious if it's actually like a top-down prioritization thing or it's just sort of holistically that's how you're thinking about it. 
Yeah, no. So when we build out the ecosystem, there's a, there's a sequencing. Um, so we first started out with the uh, smartphone accessories, like power banks. So, you know, one of the very popular companies also went public recently is Anchor on Amazon, right? They built power banks, right? And it's, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars, of, you know, worth company. And uh, we realized that, uh, you know, Anchor sells battery for, you know, 10, 15 bucks uh, in, 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 on Amazon. And, and, you know, the U.S. audience loves them. Right. Uh, but when in fact, you know, we could uh, we could sell power banks at, you know, three bucks, four bucks right, with a uh, really high quality. So that's where we started. Uh, and then since then, we moved on to the other accessories like wearables, like me watch, uh, smart watches and all that. And then after that, we start moving into small home appliances uh, like the rice cooker that you see, the robot vacuum cleaner, air purifier, water purifier. And then finally, the last phase would be the large appliances, uh, you know, the, the, the refrigerators, the washing machines, the air conditioners. And um for us, it's uh, layer after layer, uh, and, and, and the very interesting touch points uh, uh, strategy that you mentioned is that the more people start buying, uh, the more sticky it becomes, uh, at least in, 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 you know, in the network effects term. Uh, the more you connect to the network, the more you want to keep connecting. Um, so we have more than 5 million users who have uh, you know, more than uh, 10 devices connected to the Mi, Mi, Mi Home network, and um, you know, they're truly oh, wow. our core users. All right. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, in terms of the ecosystem model, um, we find the best entrepreneurs that we can, just like any VCs. And uh, we just tell them, you know, just build the best product that you can. Now, once you reach the scale that you need to, thanks to the Mi brand. So let's say you build a smartwatch. We give you the name Mi Watch. We give you the 300 million users that we have. Uh, after you have that scale, then you can almost survive as a standalone company. And when you want to do that, uh, that's when we encourage you to, okay, why don't you just go ahead and launch your own brand as well? So that the you know the market will value you, right? Otherwise, they will just see you as a supplier to Xiaomi. Um, so that's the model that we've been using and encouraging some of these entrepreneurs to do. And uh, you know, some of them already went public. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, are you are you able to say or, or speak? I mean, there's there are a lot of entrepreneurs here, um, kind of oh. listening and and that in the community. Are you able to talk about kind of how the terms of that sort of an incubation work with with Xiaomi? Like. Well, yeah. I think a lot of people are kind of familiar with the YC model, but I, I'm curious how you guys incubate and what the terms are oh, with sure. entrepreneurs. Yeah, so we, we, I think there are a few things that are a little bit different. I think uh, uh, in terms of the investment terms, uh, it still varies. Uh, though roughly speaking, we do take a 15 to 20% uh, stake uh, pretty early on. Uh, usually those teams uh, you know, only had a, a maybe 10 to 20 people team. Uh, uh, the, other, the other thing that we do is in China, you actually find a lot of um, uh, good manufacturers, very good manufacturers uh, previously you know, without their own products. So what we do is we actually go into these factories and then we identify, you know, who's the GM in this factory of, say, watches. And then, uh, you know, our team actually goes in and convince them, you know, whether you would be interested in starting something, right, that, you know, Xiaomi will back you for it. You know, you, you already know how to build an amazing watch, right? Uh, now it's your chance to start a company. Um, once they accept, uh, the only, you know, one thing that we really need them to think about, which is, do you believe in the Xiaomi model, which is you cannot charge, uh, you know, really, really expensive price. You have to accept this 5%, uh, uh, you know, philosophy. And once, it, once it's okay, uh, we, we accept them. Then uh, we, you know, do things like providing office spaces if needed. Uh, and we have a 300 people team uh, on the ecosystem side to help you uh, as an entrepreneur, like on design, uh, on supply chain, uh, on marketing, you know, all these things, uh, uh, you know, that we can, we can provide. So uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of these, uh, how will entrepreneurs uh, raise their success probability uh, thanks to this model? That's really interesting. One thing that was uh, that struck me in the in the video that you were um, you yeah. were showing about the future uh, of all these products, and and somebody messaged me about this as well, is it seemed like a lot of it almost had like a um, an augmented reality kind of display, like when you're interfacing with all of these things. Uh, is was that just sort of for the purposes of the video, or or do you are you all actually investing in things like AR, VR? Um, and how, how do you think about, how shall we think about, let's say, AR and VR as, as sort of a new platform? Yeah, no, uh, uh, so we're certainly investing in uh, a lot of these technologies. Uh, in fact, um, you know, one of my ex-bosses, uh, he's uh, Hugo Berra, who was the, you know, one of the youngest VPs at Google back in the days. So I'm sure it, you guys are acquaintances or friends as well. Um, so uh, after Hugo left Xiaomi, uh, he actually joined uh, Oculus uh, at Facebook. And, uh, you know, since then, you know, uh, Xiaomi has 
uh, been manufacturing the uh, Oculus devices, uh, you know, for Facebook as well. So I think, I think, uh, you know, it's still maybe a little bit early for in terms of user adoption in a in a wide scale. But you know, no doubt, in about five years or so, uh, you know, when the when the technology continues to mature, the cost continues to come down, the form factor uh, continues to be, you know, kind of easier to wear and all that. Uh, it, sh it, it totally would be, uh, you know, a big thing for us. So for now, it seems like an illustrative purpose, but you know, no doubt in the future, uh, I think it will be a big uh, kind of UI, UI play for us. Yeah, interesting. So you you had a, a couple of really interesting comments here, I think, around the hardware uh, incubation mm -hmm. and kind of the approach that you take there, which I thought were really interesting, like going to the manufacturers and teaching them how to get access to you know retail customers yeah. directly. Um, now, you know, sort of slicing entrepreneurship in a slightly different way, you've seen entrepreneurship in a couple of different geographies. Like you've seen it in Silicon Valley, you've seen it in Southeast Asia, you've seen it in China, you've seen it in India, which sort of all have their distinct flavors. Um, yes. Would you mind walking just like through a compare and contrast? Like uh, what have you noticed about the entrepreneurship ecosystems? What have you noticed about the investing ecosystems in each of these geographies? Oh. Like how are they similar and different? And I think those four are probably the big ones that people are most interested in, like US, China, India, Southeast Asia. Totally. No, and I, and I would argue they are probably the four largest markets uh, that one could invest in as well. I think I think uh, a lot of it comes down to culture, uh, the more I think about it, right? Like, why do this tech circle turn out that way? I think uh, uh, a lot of it comes down to the culture of the society and the people. I think when I was in the Bay Area, one of the things that, you know, really, sh you know, strike me from, you know, someone from Hong Kong is, uh, you know, how, how, how entrepreneurs can truly dream about the types of possibilities uh, in the Valley. You know, if you sit in a cafe in San Francisco and Palo Alto, uh, you hear all these like amazing kind of creative ideas kind of at your back, you know, even though some of them might sound very un unfeasible. Uh, whereas, you know, in China, you don't get that, all right? In China, you know, you're not really encouraged to think crazy. Uh, you know, in China, in the, in the in 10, 10, 12 years ago, I think a lot of people were still, you know, focused on the copying copying mode because they need to survive first. Uh, uh, that's, the, that's the first thing, you know, without surviving, then nothing matters. So you saw a lot of great entrepreneurs in China started out just, you know, copying. But then what China is really good at is uh, their operation. You know, what they're really good at maybe from the, you know, training from their manufacturers or supply chain days is that they can really get things on track. They could really ship, um, you know, they, they really move super fast on iteration. I remember hosting, uh, we actually hosted Mike Moritz uh, at Xiaomi, uh, you know, when we're still quite young, and uh, you know, he 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 stopped by around seven seven thirty p.m. Uh, at night, and you know, the whole office was full. And then you know, he was he was shocked, and he was like asking, you know, oh, you know, how late do you guys go home? And you know, most of most people go home at eleven p.m. Right. So so then he you know came back to the valley and wrote a piece on you know wow you know China is like you know uh, really pushing hard on the on the internet innovations, and you know, the startups there are so cutthroat, and and that is true. Um, you get all these people so hungry for success and, you know, they're willing to go to, you know, extra lengths. Now I'm seeing China already went past that phase. You see more entrepreneurs getting successful. You see more liquidity in the ecosystem. And therefore, now you're truly seeing, you know, true China innovation. Uh, you see, you know, social commerce, uh, like Pinduoduo being, you know, really huge. And uh, you see WeChat's super app ecosystem. You see um, uh, the China version of TikTok, which is, by the way, you know, 100 times better than the TikTok. Uh, in the states, uh, you know, like the, the innovations there on live stream commerce is just mind blowing. Right? A lot of people talk about creator economy, right? I mean, it's already happening in China. The best creators in KOLs, you know, pull in hundreds of millions on uh, on on the China TikTok uh, just through live live stream uh, commerce. All right. So, so the how does that model, work? Like they're selling they're selling products, and it's like a QVC, exactly. like real time so selling it, products. I see. Exactly. It, it, it's really fun. Um, so you know, you you log into the China TikTok, you 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 know, see your favorite KOLs videos. It's usually very creative, very engaging. There's an ad slot in it usually. So you know, in in between of the video, you know, there's a product that pops up that they that they talk about. That's one revenue stream, and then uh, the feature is uh, seamlessly transitioning over to the live stream. So while you're watching the video, sometimes they turn on the live stream. In the live stream, usually two to three people um, in the production studio uh, with very uh, professional equipments, and then uh, they will launch into products after products. Like oh, this is a product that you know I really like, and, and usually uh, advertisers need to pay for that slot. Uh, in addition to the commission uh, that you need to pay uh, to the to the KOL, right? Um, so that model is uh, extremely successful, and people love uh, love this viewing. Very engaged, uh, you know, really interesting way to sell a product. Um, so that's 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 kind of China for me. Now you are moving into this phase where you're no longer really just copying from 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 you know uh, anywhere in the world, but truly launching their own innovation. Um, now China is trying to catch up on SaaS. 
so that's another big thing. SaaS has not worked in China for 20 years. Uh, you know, com companies are not used to paying for software, uh, but this is now uh, fastly changing. Uh, and then you move to you move to India. Uh, I think uh, India uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting opportunities like SaaS. They're super strong uh, with uh, low cost engineering teams, and uh, you know obviously English speaking helps a lot as well. Uh, at the same time, uh, vernacular languages uh, is a huge huge thing. You know there's so many languages in India, and you know you see com companies like ShareChat, you know dominating social networks because they support all these type of languages. Um, Misho, another you know company that probably wouldn't have you know succeeded as much as. Uh, you know, in India, thanks to the, you know, housewife population trying to earn an income. Um, so in India, I see, you know, great engineers, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that are super articulate, um, you know, uh, really good uh, opinionated entrepreneurs as well. Um, so those are some of the, you know, qualities that you don't really see, uh, you know, in China. What they do want, though, is, um, you know, a lot of the Indian entrepreneurs love the vision that the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs oftentimes have, and they're trying to kind of emulate from that. Right. How, how do you look into the future? And then finally, Indonesia. I think Indonesia uh, is the largest market in Southeast Asia, though uh, right now competition is uh, uh, far and few between. Um, there aren't a lot of entrepreneurial energy just yet, uh, partially, again, because of the culture. People here are oftentimes quite content with what they have. They are, you know, kind of uh, they're brought up uh, that way. Uh, a lot of the good entrepreneurs that you see right now actually are imported. Uh, to Indonesia. So uh, one trend you see is actually Indian entrepreneurs now moving to Indonesia to start oh, companies. Huh, and, and that trend is yeah, that trend is fascinating to me. And uh, some of the some of the well-funded entrepreneurs in Indonesia are all, all Indians, hmm. right? Uh, I think uh, uh, Indonesia one of opportunities out there though uh, the infrastructure is still lacking. Uh, payment, uh, you know, e-payment in China again, you know, fully, uh, you know, you don't need to bring a wallet. Right uh, outside of your home in, in China, Indonesia less so. Logistics uh, still lacking. It is an island, uh, island uh, archipelago uh, country. So you know logistics yeah. is very tough. Commerce is not as adopted. So it's still very retail heavy. Uh, but then you know you get these entrepreneurs uh, trying to modernize the SM SMBs uh, stores in Indonesia. So, yeah, lots of interesting plays. Interesting. And you see all these things spreading in and out. A couple of quick follow up questions. So. Um... Somebody was asking here in this chat, like, can you expand a little bit more on why SaaS never took off in China? Sure. Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, again, the first thing that, that, that you realize is that, uh, you know, China and the 20 years ago, uh, you know, had mostly pirated, uh, pirated software. You know, they never thought that you need to pay for software. I think that that kind of culture has always been there. The second thing is, uh, you know, labor. Uh, in China back then was also extremely cheap. Like uh, you get, you know, all these amazing engineers and, you know, you can assemble your own team and they can probably churn out a software for you in three weeks. You know, I, I think the cultural shock for me when I first moved from the Valley to China was, uh, you know, for Flipboard. So I was tasked to open up the Flipboard China office uh, in Beijing and, you know, Flipboard took, you know, a year to develop uh, the UI and all that. And once I got to China, I, I had 20 clones, you know, 20 clones of Flipboard and, you know, they were able to, to, to do it out in, in one month. Um, so I think that that culture, you know, in the beginning really kind of stifled um, the adoption of SaaS. And uh, soon after, once we moved into cloud, um, that's when that model started picking up. And that's when the CFOs and CIOs and the likes started thinking, oh, you know, actually, you know, subscribing to these and, you know, allocating a budget to SaaS uh, is quite important. Um, and since then, and, you know, obviously thanks to the wave of SaaS companies going public too in the States, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, VCs, uh, the ecosystem are now turning over to it. Um, the Shopify models, there are a couple Shopify uh, like companies in China that are getting a lot of um, traction uh, after COVID. Um, so then you are now finally seeing, you know, some of these uh, uh, SaaS companies uh, flourishing. Uh, it's still very early, still very early. I think the VCs are betting for the next five to seven years. Time frame uh, that more and more of these will, will go live. Sort of probing on that a little bit. Do you think the the cost of labor had anything to do with SaaS not taking off as much? Like if labor is just really cheap in in some of these markets, like do you do you just not want to automate it with software if you can just hire a human to to do a bunch of things that that a SaaS or an API tool could do? Yeah, no, I totally saw that uh, at least you know for for a good five years. Uh, you know that's usually the easy way out. Um, you know, actually in in, uh, in Indonesia as well, or in other you know China as well, more and more people are setting up their engineering shop in India, right? Um, you know, you can find a lot of great talents uh, for maybe probably one fifth of Silicon Valley's cost, and uh, it helps you finish a lot of these tasks without you know needing to pay. So. So yeah, so I think I think that's that's definitely play a big factor, though. Uh, you know, I think as the SaaS software also gets more and more sophisticated, more and more advanced, uh, that, that option will you know becoming more and more attractive. 
I see. Sort of, you know, a market related question on Southeast Asia, like you were talking about the logistics challenges of, of yes. uh, Indonesia. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, do you think it's possible to launch a global software brand or a global technology company from like headquartered in Southeast Asia, like in Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam. And the reason I ask is it, it reminds me a little bit of Europe in that mm -hmm. like, because you have so many different languages and slightly different cultures, even though they're geographically near yeah. each other, it's like really hard because you're, you, you like tap out on your local market really fast. And then right. you have to build like, you know, the new language and the new interface and, the, and yes. a different sales team yeah. and a different regulatory regime. And that creates all this fragmentation. And so European companies historically have had a very tough time like launching to a yes. global platform. Whereas like Chinese and Indian and American companies built for the domestic market, which is huge. And then they can springboard global. Like yeah. I'm curious how you yeah. see that playing out in Southeast Asia. Yeah, no, totally agreed. Uh, I think there are only two companies uh, on top of my mind that had a little bit of success, right? One is the Gojek and Grab type of companies, right? So they are, you know, no longer just the Uber. They are trying to be the super app, right, of Southeast Asia. And, you know, the the, the rice and the go food and, you know, the food delivery would be their core business, but they're, you know, trying to put a lot of these other payments and all these other services on top of their app, right? And they're, they're having some moderate success, though, uh, you know, still in the kind of uh, burning, burning cash phase, uh, and these two companies are still battling one another. Um, the other one that is truly successful, and again, you see a crazy stock run up uh, the last year is uh, SEA. SEA, um, you know, the, the, the mother company that runs Garena, which is the, you know, uh, games, uh, as well as uh, Shopee, which is the number one Southeast Asia e-commerce platform. So, you know, here, uh, they actually a 20 year old company and uh, Garena actually uh, gives them a lot of uh, uh, bullet and ammunition thanks to the you know high margin of the gaming business and games. Uh, by the way, can cross culture uh, much easier, right? So, so for them, that is their fortress. You know, they get that, that's their cash cow. Once they have that, they moved into e-commerce, and e-commerce share the same infrastructure. Obviously, they localize their SKUs, they localize their interfaces. Um, they have separate country teams, uh, and then after that, they move into payments. So then, through this step by step, they manage to you know dominate uh, Southeast Asia. And now they're worth about you know 150 billion, and and you know from jumping from 30 billion to 150 billion in in one year. Mm, fascinating. Um, maybe, uh, maybe last question before before we let you go, and we'll almost be at time. 